Uh, I'm putting this video together for, uh, for the research team there at Sid Ross uh, place here and I, I was looking at possibly putting together a bunch of the different videos and maybe putting in some little inserts there for you um, to give you a better idea of the things and the way God has dealt with me in the past. But uh, the more that I begin to go back through these videos, it, it, it takes a while sometimes when I'm explaining some of the revelations that God's dealing with me on. To, to, it would just end up being, I think, too lengthy to go through. Uh, I am, however, in an email I will also send to you, I will put in some of the key videos where some of the, the revelations that God has revealed have come out at. Uh, part of these revelations are written in the two different books that I've written. Uh, one, and I kind of hold this up here. I didn't drop this book off with you guys. It's Israel, Are They Still God's People? Uh, the cover of this book ended up coming out very nice. Uh, Yum Soup, which is the book that you guys uh, have there. Uh, the cover did not come out as nice as I was hoping, but uh, I think we could probably re have the cover redone a little bit more professionally. But uh, Mary Neal Wyatt was kind enough to allow us to use a photo of the chariot wheel that uh, Ron Wyatt discovered on the, uh, the Gulf of Aquaba. So we, we really appreciated that. But uh, we can change that depending on what's needed. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to mention, though, if you've seen the back of the book here, we've got several people that have commented on the story itself of the Red Sea crossing, uh, including Dr. James Dobson, Dr. Chuck Missler, Rabbi Lappin, Daniel Lappin, that is, Dr. Ken Hansen, and author Rex Burns. Uh, I think author Rex Burns sums up the, the gist of the entire book when he says, Yom Suf is a moving and sincere exploration of the biblical prophecy on levels of meaning that are both deeply personal as well as historical. Dunin has established striking parallels between the latest archaeological evidence of the exodus across the Sea of Reeds and the Bielski defiance of Nazi persecution of the 20th century. Um, the work also demonstrates convincing faith in the immediate relevance of biblical encoding to present to present and to future events. The author's own story of his pursuit of those meanings give added warmth and conviction uh, to the narrative. Let me, let me just kind of touch on some things, though, before I discuss with you the book and what's actually written in the book here. Uh, I believe in the book of Yom Suf, I do go into some things in my past here. The first book, Israel, Are They Still God's People? It may be important for you guys to know. I began this book in secret. My wife was uh, belonged to the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, she, I, I, I really felt compelled in my heart to write this book that it might would help her to come out of that organization. So I began writing the book in secret. And God is also, and this was back in, I want to say, 2010. Uh, it's also where the story of Yom Sufa's first birth, because this is also the time that God really dealt with me a lot on a lot of different revelations that began to start unfolding in my life there. Um, but God miraculously met with my wife and revealed to me before about a month before she would come out of the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses that this was going to happen. And she had a supernatural visitation of the Lord Jesus Christ who came and revealed to her that she was in a cult. Didn't even have to tell her about the book, but when she read the book later, when she came out, uh, it was really exciting. Of course, the book, I finished it after she came out. Just a little thought there that you might uh, find interesting there. Um, Going into my background a little bit, though, my entire life has really been uh, an event of supernatural events, uh, no doubt. And I don't say that as a cliche. I, I just simply bring that out because maybe it might be something that's important to Sid. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Um, from the time I've been a child, my life has been spared miraculously on numerous occasions. Uh, my sister, who called me not too long ago, was bringing some of these things out. In fact, she called me weeping. Uh, someone that's actually a backslidden Christian, but she called me weeping. And she said, Stephen, I know that God has called you for a purpose. I know it. I feel it. I believe it. And she began to relate to me the different events in, our, in my life as a child where God saved my life one time falling over a cliff in uh, the Smoky Mountains. Uh, when she held my hand screaming for my parents and they came and they pulled me back over. I did not plunge to the bottom and was not killed there. Uh, another time was when the, we had turned on a gas heater in the house and the house was full of gas. My mother had gone to the store when she came back. We, we were in, the, in my bedroom striking matches trying to light the heater. I was about nine years old 
And she said, my mother always said, why didn't you guys die is just a miracle in itself. Um, so many things like that have happened. Uh, I can recall as I became a young man, the Lord speaking to me audibly uh, on several instances. Uh, one in particular that was fascinating, this kind of started this whole journey, was when the Lord spoke to me audibly and told me when I was about 21 years old, read Isaiah 61. Never did explain why he asked me to read that. He just told me to do so. Um, and through the hearing God audibly speak on several occasions, I say God, maybe it's the angel of the Lord, I don't know. I have seen the angel of the Lord twice in vision and uh, interesting in, in itself. Um, the Lord spoke to me audibly about my mother when she was totally blind and said, pray for her eyes. And she received 20-20 vision the same day. Um, I prayed for my mother to walk, who was a quadriplegic as a result of an air embolism to the brain when doctors said there was no way anything could ever help her. And I watched her walk before the Lord took her home a couple of years later. She became a Christian herself, being of uh, Jewish descent as well. And... Uh, uh, I've seen the dead raised. I've seen many people by the grace of God that he's allowed me to pray for with cancers that doctors have given them up, uh, that he allowed me the privilege to pray for them and God would heal them completely. Uh, it's not everybody that you lay hands on that get well, but it seems that he's given me a gift to be able to speak to people, to encourage their faith, to believe. Um, I don't really go into that, into these two books. Israel, are they still God's people? Uh, is written more from my heart. It's refuting the enemies of Israel is what the, the cover of the book speaks about. Uh, in this book here though, God really began to reveal a lot about the story of Joseph and the parallels uh, that Jews can understand. And that seems to be the way God deals with me mostly is insights and revelations that unquestionably are supernatural because these are insights that scholars have l never uh, understood and yet uh, I don't consider myself a quote-unquote biblical scholar although there are many scholars that consider that because of the unusualness of the revelations that God has given me but um, uh, but Israel are they still God's people it's a little hard to follow because I did not have an editor at the time when I wrote this book uh, whereas the editor that helped me on Yam Suf really helped put the book in a, in a, in a more of a logical order uh, we might say but um, with Israel, are they still God's people? This is when God first began to deal with me. And uh, I, I don't recall for sure on some of the revelations that God gave me about the story of Joseph. But let me just share with you. Um, and, and many. And by the way, we do have a YouTube channel. I have a website called IsraelReturns.com. Um, on the YouTube channel, it's Ben Dinoon, B-E-N-D-E-N-O-O-N. And for the record, my legal name is Stephen Kateriel Ben-Nun. It's uh, like Joshua's name in the Bible, uh, the Hebrew version. Uh, right under the name Dinun because our family had, uh, from, from what we can go back and tell, then our, our name was changed from Ben-Nun to Dinun, And it's believed to have been done uh, more so as a result of uh, the persecution of the Jews during the uh, Inquisition. Now that's just from the Dinuns that I've met that are still Jewish. Uh, that have related some of the stories of the family there. My father's side, however, did convert to Christianity, no telling when, but seems to be way back. Uh, my mother's side, they just stayed uh, non-religious uh, more so. Uh, I am very much involved, though, with the Chabad organization of Jews, uh, Orthodox Jewish people, um, throughout my life, and uh, was bar mitzvahed when I was 40 years old uh, in Israel. I lived in Israel. I survived a suicide bombing. Uh, while I lived there in two, uh, September the, um, oh gosh, I want to say it's September 22nd, 2004. I have to double back and check. Sometimes I'm not great on dates. That in itself, though, was miraculous. I write about that in the book Yam Suf. You can read that in the first part of the book in the opening there. The prologue of the book is where I write about that. But very interesting story indeed. Uh, while I was going to pray, uh, it's, it was just something was going on in my mind, and I didn't realize at the time it was God leading me away from a suicide bomber that had uh, that was fixing to be dropped out on the very street that I was on and walked down with me towards the bus stop. Uh, and I'm thinking, and it's my own thoughts as I'm 
uh, going in a different direction where uh, was which was a way and not the way that I normally would go to where I would go pray at and then uh, suddenly a thought comes to my mind not knowing it's the devil trying to kill me uh, that says you know you hate this way you idiot why are you going this way and I'm thinking to myself that's right so I turn around I go back I get on the main road I start walking down uh, just moments later a Palestinian girl was put out uh, strapped with explosives uh, just right there uh, opposite of the street of me and then another thought comes to my mind and I didn't even realize it was God himself speaking to my heart that says to me if you go this way, you'll get to that corner and you will stand there. You have one more phone call to make. You'll turn your back to the wind because the wind's always blue and it's not loud and people couldn't hear me. And you will, you will turn your back to that wind and you won't leave. And so then I'm like, fine, I'll just go down the hill. So I, as I turn around, I come back, I start back the way that God was trying to get me to go in the first place. And right as I get to the bottom of the hill, it's basically still parallel to the very spot, but going down the hill puts the mountainside to shield me. And then this young lady blows herself up, 18 years old, kills herself, kills the two guards that are there. Um, when I went back up the top of the hill, you could see the shrapnel that struck the pole right where I always stood at. And uh, I realized then that it was God's mercy upon me. Uh, there were many, many miracles that happened. When I lived in Israel, uh, I received a phone call from the United States uh, while I was there. And it was uh, when I was living there. Uh, it was a summertime, by the way. I spent a summertime over in Israel. And uh, when I received the phone call, I was able to take the phone call and talk to the friend that was on the other line there without a telephone cord in the phone. Uh, that was fascinating in itself. So always something. In fact, if you're looking, if you can see back here, maybe I'll bring this up for the camera too. Um, another very interesting thing that happened when I lived in Israel was uh, this picture right here. Um, and this picture here, you can see, I took it in Hezekiah's tunnel here, and there's a hand right here. There's a friend of mine in the background that's standing there. And it looks like the face of a man there. It is uh, what I believe is the pillar of fire, the Shekinah glory of God, uh, took, taken in Hezekiah's tunnel. And I never will forget when I asked the Lord about this, I thought, gosh, how I would have loved myself just to have been in that picture. And yet, when I asked the Lord about that in prayer, I just kept thinking, God, how I'd have loved to have been in that picture. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and reminded me, you asked me to take the picture, and I honored your request. So, just really fascinating. Yom Suf, let's take a look, serious look about Yom Suf. Yom Suf is uh, an incredible book that it was, I would have to say, is when God really began to deal with me about the revelations on the Jewish people. Uh, it is a, what I believe, and many scholars are wondering about, including Chuck Missler, who uh, I interviewed with. Uh, actually, he was doing a, um, he w agreed to take part in uh, the documentary for the History Channel for this story. And uh, when I say the documentary, there's been some interest uh, from people from the History Channel that I know personally that work there that, that say they would enjoy, that they believe that this story would be very good. So Cook Productions put together the reel, I think, that you guys already have. If you haven't got it, if you get with uh, Carol uh, Sheets, uh, she has actually viewed that already. But the documentary footage that they're putting together there only tells about the 3,500-year-old biblical mystery that God has dealt with me on Yom Suf, which looks at why did Moses call the, the, the Red Sea, as we call it, the Red Sea crossing. In Hebrew, he calls it Yom Suf, which means Sea of Reeds. And when Moses calls this a Sea of Reeds, it has caused debate for... We can, I can go back in historical writings back 2,000 years and still see the debates from rabbinical scholars that are trying to determine why did Moses call the Red Sea a Sea of Reeds? Because we do have the evidence of the Bible saying the water was a wall to the right and to the left. Um, the arguments of where they crossed at you know, for, for, for millennia have uh, raged on because at that time they had not discovered any evidence as of yet where they crossed. So they looked all the way back into the Nile Delta. 
the top of the Suez, et cetera, those different places there, until Ron Wyatt and Vivica Pontian both discovered uh, remnants of chariot wheels in the Gulf of Aqaba, one on the Egyptian side, one on the Saudi side. Uh, documentary done with uh, Dr. Um, uh, Leonard Moeller, uh, The Exodus Revealed, really brought in a lot of that uh, information there. And of course, I was aware of that, but I, had, even myself, had always wondered why would God call uh, uh, in this case, if this is where they really cross in the Gulf of Aqaba, why would he call a reedless area a sea of reeds? And I wrote about that in one of the chapters of Israel, Are They Still God's People? But God had not finished revealing everything to me as of yet. What brought this story to life, though, was my wife and I, I had actually met uh, uh, Michael Bielski, who is the son of Tuvia Bielski, where the movie was made of his father uh, called Defiance, where the Defiance movie is really the catalyst, it's the inspiration behind the book Yom Suf. However, keep in mind as I begin, I want to tell, I want to break down a little bit of this, uh, the story here. I know that uh, Carol uh, Sheets has the video where the Cook Productions did uh, a little splash reel for the History Channel uh, that gives you a little bit of insight about the story, comparing it to the Bielski story in the movie Defiance, a uh, movie that was where Daniel Craig plays to be a Bielski, and uh, Leif Schreiber plays uh, Zeus, his brother, and then another actor that plays a soil there. But uh, ironically, I meet Michael Bielski, the son of the very um, lead character, before God revealed the story itself to me. And in fact, meeting Michael Bielski and later becoming good friends with him caused us to go back and look at the movie again. And when uh, I was watching the movie with my wife at home, we see uh, the, the Bielski uh, Otriad, they come down to the sea of reeds there. And when it flashes on the big screen, uh, the movie being filmed in Lithuania, for those that may not know that, it's the same wilderness, just a different swamp. I immediately was struck by inspiration. And when I was struck by that inspiration, I hit pause on the television. And I looked over at my wife. I said, that is what Moses was talking about. And she was unaware of the story. She was unaware of the events that, that I was speaking of there. But what I wanted her to see and understand was that it was, uh, and, and there again, I'm under an inspiration as I'm seeing this. You know, I, I'm, I'm in awe over it. Uh, and only later to find out that the Bielski story has so many similarities to the actual story of Moses and the Exodus. They, they move around from place to place while they are in the, in the wilderness running from the, uh, the Germans. Uh, and it, it finally, when they get to the last place where they're at, they're not far from that very swamp that they cross in the movie. Oddly enough though, Tuvia also being mili military trained, he was trained in the Polish army, he did a lot of things very military-like uh, uh, as far as the styles of things that he did. Uh, but Michael Bielski, his son, was able to relate to me things that you don't see in the movie that were just really incredible in itself. And some of those things that I found fascinating was, uh, for example, um, his father he said even though he was not a religious man as far as an Orthodox Jew, he still was very passionate about God, about Zionism, about uh, believing in the roots of the Jewish people, that you know, that Hashem, the, the Lord God, was our deliverer. And when he was trying to lead his people, he was constantly referring back to the Torah. How did Moses lead his people? And, the, and, the, and the many of the uh, survivors called him their modern-day Moses. Um, but try to make this a little bit quick here so we don't linger too long on this because what Yom Suf goes into later is far deeper than just the story of Yom Suf or the Bielski, uh, the Bielski uh, Otriad there. When he gets ready though to cross or, or to, to flee the Germans that are coming, that are invading in, Tuvia lines up his people into a row just as Moses had lined up his people in a row when they were getting ready to make the final journey into Saudi Arabia uh, or what's not modern day Saudi Arabia, Midia at the time when suddenly God instructs Moses to make a turn and go and camp by Pehahiroth, uh, the mouth of the gorges uh, that went down the dry riverbed to the Gulf of Aqaba. Tuvia did the same thing. He lined up his people in a row 
they thought they were going to go in the same direction as the escaping partisans, the Russian partisans, the Polish partisans, but then Tuvia oddly says to them, turn, and he sends his people down next to the edge of the swamp. Now the movie kind of shows that they're being killed, some of them and stuff like that. In real life, none of them were killed, and that's one of the most incredible parts of the story. Um, when they get there, they kind of dramatize it to make it look a little bit biblical. The statements that are said there are not actually true, but they do cross through that sea of reeds. In fact, his son said to me that that was the reason why the Germans could not find them. The reeds actually hid them in. Another ironic thing, though, in, in the parallel of this, though, is that the place where they crossed to the island they went to, they actually go to an island. They don't go to the other side and they fight the Germans again. That's kind of a little bit of the Hollywood side of the movie. But they go to an island, and on that island, it was eight and a half miles to the center of the swamp to get to the island. Ironically, on the Gulf of Aqaba, it's eight and a half miles across to the other side. Uh, so there are so many parallels in the story of Moses and the story of Tuvia Bialski. Uh, now, Carol Sheets, when she sent me an email after watching the little reel that I sent to her, she mentioned to me as a, as a personal thought, isn't this interesting because... What, do you think that maybe there, that this, you know, when you look at the numbers, 1,200 Jews were rescued uh, compared to the uh, over a million uh, Jews were rescued in the time of Moses, could this only parallel something or foreshadow something that is yet to come? Well, in the book Yom Suf, yes, it does, and yes, we do address that. Uh, but let me just point out one other ironic thing about that, though. According to Judaism, it was 1.2 million Jews that came out of uh, bondage out of Egypt, and so for it to be 1,200 Jews that were rescued by the Bielski Altriad, or the Bielski brothers there, that was ironic in itself. Uh, of course, we also find that uh, Moses had his brother Aaron, and in this case here we find that Tuvia, of course, he has both his brothers, actually uh, three of his brothers there, uh, Zeus and Asoil, but we find that Asoil ends up being one that's more close to him like Aaron is and sticks with him while Zeus goes out and fights other battles. Uh, so, so many parallels that are there. But now, let me just touch real quick though on the supernatural side of this that a lot of times people don't look at. Uh, and there again, I don't mean this in any form of a cliche with uh, Sid Roth's program being supernatural uh, or as supernatural, but we have to honestly take a look at what God is doing in all of this. Because when it comes to myself, I'm no one special. I'm just like any other person. But the things that God is revealing to my heart are things that Jewish people can relate to. The last chapter of Yom Suf is probably the most, is without question, it's the most powerful chapter of the book. Yom Suf only begins to show what God is about to do. The, the looking forward, when Moses, when he said Yom Suf, he was prophesying, unbeknownst to him, no doubt, as even Chuck Missler points out, and if you look on the YouTube videos, there's one with me with Chuck Missler. Keep in mind, this was not the actual interview. We're just, do, we're just speaking with each other as if we're friends. We're, they're, they're videotaping the whole dialogue uh, to where they can use excerpts from that for the History Channel footage later. Uh, so... But Chuck uh, points out that, um, oh gosh, I don't even know why I was going with that statement there. Uh, but, but, but going back to the, to the story here uh, with Yom Suf, we have to, we have to realize that um, this story is, is, you know, it's unbeknownst to Moses that he is prophetically speaking of a future event that is fulfilled in the Holocaust. And... This is not just, as my wife asked me the, when I first saw this, how could you prove this biblically? And immediately I knew that in Jeremiah 23, also Jeremiah 16, which happens to refer to the same thing, I knew that it was biblical because God, when he revealed the story to me, showed me how that Jeremiah writes of this when he says, and just paraphrasing this, that, that the children of Israel... Um, they will no longer say that the Lord lives and delivers the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So he refers back to the Exodus, but he said they will say that the Lord lives and delivers the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and all the other countries where they've been driven to. Now, why then does God take, through Jeremiah, separate the north country and it's the descendants of the house of Israel 
So we know it's somewhere off in the future. And he separates the North Country from the rest of the world of the Jews that return to the homeland. Now, many scholars agree Jeremiah 23 is the prophetic fulfillment of Israel becoming a nation today. But Moses is referring to the Exodus. And yes, it is an Exodus of mass proportions from all around the world, the Jews returning to their homeland. But in this case, the North Country is separated, and no doubt why, because the Bielski family is in Belarus, what is considered by many scholars to be part of Russia, the North Country. And so we see the Exodus story repeating itself through the Bielski uh, clan there. And, uh, but what's fascinating though, is as Carol brings out about this foreshadowing of future event, yes it does. Uh, when I first discussed this with one rabbi here in Southwest Florida, I remember the rabbi saying to me, Stephen, he said, you know, it's easy for Jews to believe what you have discovered here because we have where Rashi mentions about Moses in Exodus 15 when he says, You know, I will sing unto the Lord how that he has gotten victory over the haughty one, over his horse and over his rider. And... The rabbi did not know what he was saying at the time when he said that he's gotten victory over his horse and over his rider. I recognized immediately by the revelation of God that horse and his rider is speaking of the Antichrist spirit that rides in the book of Revelation. But I also knew immediately when he said that too, that Asherah, Adonai, I will sing unto the Lord. We do know Rashi points out in the Midrash that, uh, that Moses undoubtedly will have to return, and they believe it to be in the Messianic age, when the Messiah would return, to be able to teach the children of Israel the Song of Moses. Well, then we see in the book of Revelation, I get a little excited about this, so pardon me, I, mean, I know you guys are doing this for research, but just please bear with me. But we see that Moses... In Revelation 15, corresponding with it, and a lot of these I'm just paraphrasing, guys, so just bear with me on, on that there so I don't have to waste too much of your time. Moses comes out there, and our, we know that Moses has to return because it says that they, they come out on the Sea of Glass. Here's the third exodus and the final exodus for Israel. And they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb, showing that the Jews in the very end end up recognizing Jesus to be the Messiah, but they sing the song of Moses. They had to learn it then from Moses because Moses says he will sing it in the future. You know, and, and it's just beautiful, this story here. But notice the detail. Moses is not with them perfectly in line with the scripture, because why? When they get their final deliverance, their final exodus over the sea of glass, this mingled with fire, which shows that God takes them over the judgment. When God is getting ready to rain down the fire and brimstone, we got, we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story all over again here. He goes to rain down the fire of judgment, and then what do they do? They go through that fiery judgment over a sea of glass, going through the judgments of God, being spared and not dying of it, they're singing the song of Moses. Moses was here with Elijah, one of the two witnesses. And I know there's a lot of debates over who the two witnesses are. Many people think it's Enoch and, 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 and Moses, excuse me, Elijah. But even Chuck Missler, when we discuss that very topic there, Chuck said it has to be Moses. You know, so it's this debatable issue there. Now, that was something else, though, that God revealed to me. Not only do we see it as Jews that Moses will return, we know that Elijah has to return according to Malachi 4, the prophecy there that he would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And Jesus only apports, uh, uh, purport, uh, uh, puts part of that Malachi 4 to John, and that's where he turns the hearts of the fathers to the children, not the heart of the children back to the fathers. And what is the heart of the fathers? The heart of the fathers was Mashiach. And that's what John came and did. The very heart of the fathers was to see the Messiah. And so what did John do? He comes and he introduces the Messiah. And then, then we have, it's fascinating, but then that second half of Elijah, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which has never been fulfilled yet, is he turns the children's hearts back to the fathers. In other words, the father's hearts were for them to see the Messiah, but the children didn't get it. But in this day, the children of the fathers, the Jewish people, will get it because Elijah then turns their hearts back to the fathers, which their heart, the heart of the father again was the seeing of Mashiach, so they finally get it. 
Now, some more insights. Let me just kind of go through these quickly because I, I could be here all night with you guys. And uh, uh, we, we look, though, like for proof for Moses, for example, another proof for his return. God himself tells Moses he's going to return. Remember in the story of Exodus when he first begins to reveal to Moses the signs and he has his hand, he puts it in his bosom, it turns to leprosy, takes his staff, throws it on the ground, turns into a serpent, turns it back to a staff again. Then God says something very kind of, in, it's kind of interesting, it's a little odd. Uh, and most people never think of it. God says to Moses, if they do not believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. It almost sounds like a confused statement. God is saying, if they don't believe, in other words, they may, they may not believe the voice of the first sign, but they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. You know, I remember when God first revealed that to my heart. I mean, this is something Jews can get. You know, we can, we can get these things. See, why? Because even Paul records that the Jews never believed Moses. They didn't believe him the first time he come. But according to God's own statement, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Moses was the voice of God to his people. So they're going to believe the voice of the latter sign. And of course they do believe because we find in Revelation 15, they do believe because they sing the song of the Lamb. So... And then, of course, Elijah's with him to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Wow. And, and of course, the heart of the children, you've got to keep in mind, their heart, too, is to see Mashiach. They're longing to see Mashiach right now. Um, okay, so anyway, let's go into some other things there. And, and there's a lot of the videos. Let me just, real quick, I'll name some of the videos if you want to look at some of these here on YouTube. Uh, one is called Returning to God. Another one, the crown of thorns reveals the identity of the Messiah. That's what I want to speak to now. As Jews, we should have recognized who the Messiah was by the mere fact that a crown of thorns had been placed upon his head. And why? When Moses met God at the burning bush, in Hebrew is Esh Sinai, Esh is fire, Sinai is thorn, thorn bush. And it was God that spoke from the midst of the thorn bush. That's the way it says in Hebrew. God spoke, uh, Yahweh spoke from the midst of that thorn bush. And so when they put the crown of thorns upon Jesus' head when he was being crucified, it was an open sign to the Jews. God was once again in tabernacle. In what? Inside the glory, the kavod. Is he was in that... What, you have to understand, when Moses met God at the burning bush, it talks about the angel of the Lord, or the angel, in, I think it's in Isaiah 63, speaks about the angel of his presence. And the pillar of fire was the form in which God was, had come down, and basically that the pillar of fire was what he was clothed in, we might say. God had taken on the pillar of fire, and that's the angel of the Lord that's standing there. And he speaks from the midst of, of the thorn bush or the midst of the pillar of fire out of the thorn bush. Now, here God is in tabernacled in a human body called Jesus. The fullness of God dwelt in him and he's speaking out of the midst of that body, which is what? In the thorn bush again, the crown of thorns on his head and God's speaking out of that body. We should have recognized that he was Moshiach by the thorn bush itself. And yet the Romans put it on his head. And that's something the Romans did it and the Jews don't get it. It just wasn't meant for us at that time. Now, ah, wow. Let me tell you another, another beautiful, I mean, this, this, and, and this, by the way, is in the book Yom Suf. Incredible revelations there on the story of Joseph. Now, scholars have done a beautiful job on the story of Joseph, revealing all kinds of, uh, of things that let us know that, you know, Jesus, for example, was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Joseph was sold for 22 pieces of silver. Um, so many things of, of the typology that we can have there that we should have see that jo Joseph is a type of Mashiach. But unfortunately, we don't get it. But God revealed to me some fresh things in the story of Joseph that makes the Jews begin to recognize who the Messiah really is. And I write about them in the book here, uh, the book of Yom Suf here. Now, there's some things, though, as God has refined these revelations that may not be in the book of Yom Suf. And this is one reason why I want to do another book here soon uh, that, would be, that I'm in, planning on entitling uh, Moses, What Would Moses Say? 
um, regarding some of these things. The story of Joseph, though, is so fascinating because we find in the story of Joseph several little key points. And, uh, and there, there are several videos that I do on this. One of those is called The Crown of Thorns Reveals... Oh, no, that's not the one. Um... Oh gosh, I forget which one it is. I, I do a series on Joseph. And maybe that might be one of the best places if you want to watch it on YouTube to, to follow that out. But in the story of Joseph, when he comes down, or when his and his brothers see him coming, and they take and they throw him in the ditch, and when they finally sell him to the to the Ishmaelites, um, or that are the, the band that are going down there, they take a, a goat and they slay the goat and they pour the blood over his coat and they take it back to his father. I believe that this is the very place where God used for Moses for the law that he gave for Israel for the goat, the scapegoat, and the sacrificial lamb that was offered up for Israel for once a, once a year for their sins. I believe it's from the story of Joseph itself, and it speaks to the Jewish heart, no doubt, of Moshiach, and it will make more sense to them. Because why? Here his brothers come along, and really and truly because of the evil that they did to Joseph, God rightly should have judged them, and it would have wiped out ten of the tribes. Because the only other tribe that was there was Benjamin, and Benjamin wasn't guilty. But with Joseph, though, his brothers are guilty, and they take the blood, when they pour that blood over his garment and take it back to his father, it is showing the type of the law that Moses, God would instruct Moses with later about taking the goat, the scapegoat, confessing the sins of Israel on the scapegoat, a strong man takes him out and releases him out into the wilderness, while the other goat becomes a sacrifice. And the goat that became the sacrifice for sin, when they took that goat and cut his throat and put it on his brother's garment, God accepted that goat as a sacrifice for their sins. And he had to have done it. You go take it now and compare that then with Jesus. When Jesus is, is taken out by his own brother and they're going, to, they're going to offer him up as a sacrifice, they cried out, let his blood be upon us and on our children. Now, they meant it for evil. And a lot of times scholars have always taken it that way. They said, look what's happened to Israel as a result. But the true revelation behind it was God, when they cried out, let his blood be upon us and on our children, God took that blood and he applied it to them pardoning grace. No wonder why Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, it was, it was mercy. It was mercy being given to them. And Jesus played both goat, sacrificial lamb, and scapegoat because he took the sins of Israel far away, just like Joseph. Joseph bared the iniquities of his brothers in his bosom, and he carried them down into Egypt away from the sight of his father. And his father had no idea what happened. There's your scapegoat. There's your sacrificial goat. And yet Jesus was able to play both parts. He played the sacrifice and as well. He bore the sins of Israel very far away. So, <clears throat> but the whole story of Joseph, though, gets even better, though. <laughs> when his brothers go to recognize, they haven't recognized who he is, but Joseph comes into power just as Jesus came into power. Then they go down because there's a famine in the land. And they go down to get, uh, to get grain. And Joseph recognizes them, showing that Israel's returning to her homeland. And as they get the grain, Joseph commands to put the money back in the bag. And when they go back on their way home, they stop at an inn. <clears throat> in Hebrew, it says Bamalon, at the hotel. And they discover their money in the bag at the hotel. Scholars have never figured this out yet, but for Jews, it'll make more sense to us now. Why the hotel? The first place Jesus was ever rejected by the Jewish people was when he was in the womb of his mother at a hotel when he should have been born a proper birth, but he was rejected and sent to a stable. Of course, he had to be born in a stable because he was the Lamb of God. Lambs are not born in hotels. We know that. I mean, all this is for a purpose, but it's also the rejection. And that's why the story of Joseph shows that they find their money in their bag at the hotel, showing when they first rejected Christ. Now, he goes back. He tells his father. The father is all distraught over this. Per adventure, as an oversight. He sends them back with double the money. Why double the money? 
not only to pay for a new grain, but also to take back the money for the grain that they had already bought, plus an extra for the new grain. He gives them that. It's because in a foreshadowing, Jacob literally pays for the sins of his own sons that they committed against Joseph as well as he pays for future sins of Israel. God already accepting the sacrificial offering. Now Christ foreshadowing that Christ would actually pay the sin. That Christ would be the one that actually pays the sin. But it's the double portion. It's Isaiah 61 all over again. The very scripture that God tells me to read when I'm 21 years old. You know, Kore Yeshayahu Shishim Vechad. Read Isaiah 61. It doesn't say why, but if you look at it, Isaiah 61, what is it? We see uh, Christ is the beginning of the coming, but his second half of his ministry is never uh, spoken of there. He doesn't read the second half of his ministry in, in verse 2, only half of verse 2. And then we find out that Israel recognizes their Messiah in Isaiah 61. We find out that there's aliens shall be your plowmen. There's your two witnesses. I mean, it's just fascinating the things that God is doing here. But... I think the most beautiful revelation that God has given me, and I'm, I'm just barely skimming over the things that God is, is showing that are things that Jews should be able to understand and recognize. In fact, I had one Israeli lady, by the way, for those of you that are, are doing the research on this, and I can give you her name, uh, born in Israel, raised in Israel, came to the United States, I don't know exactly when. She has watched video after video, and she has asked to translate them, uh, or, or, or said she would help in translating them into the Hebrew language. And she tells me, Steve, this is what our people can understand. It's what God deals with you on. But let me get to that, that great revelation was also the cup. Remember when Benjamin comes down, the brother that was not guilty? And when Joseph commands his servant to put their money back in their sacks, and this time he puts the cup in Benjamin's bag, such a beautiful, beautiful revelation in that. Because when he goes back home and he's taking that cup, they, he has no idea he's carrying the cup. And the servant overtakes him. He says, why would you do evil to your master when he's done nothing but good for you? Well, I'm getting, getting a revelation just as I tell you this here. Same thing with Israel today. They constantly speak evil of Jesus and yet he's done so much good for them. That's why the cup is put in their bag. Yes, no, they were not guilty of him being crucified. My forefathers were, yes. But was I there? Did I have a part in that? No. But the cup is in my hand. That cup, the very cup, it tells us that we rejected Jesus at the communion table. Our forefathers did. But Benjamin has the cup in his hand, and he's innocent. But why? Why is that cup in Benjamin's hand? It's letting us know what we did. He was rejected at communion table. But here we are, the innocent one. But no doubt we still, we still reject him. So it's another one of the great revelations that God has given me. And, and uh, gosh, I mean, uh, there's so many. And another one that's written, in, I think it's written in both books. Israel, are they still God's people as well as uh, Yom Suf? And that is the, the, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the most beautiful thing in the world, when Jesus says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sanctify your name. Do you realize that Jesus was having the entire world pray for the return of Israel to their homeland? And how do we know this? When God showed me that, I was blown away. I was reading in Ezekiel 36. When God, and I'm just paraphrasing again, He tells Israel, I will return you to your homeland, not for your sake, O Israel, but for my name's sake. I will bring you from the lands that I have driven you to, where you profaned my name, because the people, when they see you there, they say, this is the children of God, and they're not in their homeland. And you profaned my name that way. It's as if God can't keep his word. So God brings back Israel to the homeland, not for their sake, for his name's sake. And then he says in Ezekiel, when you are in your homeland and they see you in your homeland, then my name will be hallowed. Then my name will be sanctified. So Jesus was praying and teaching his apostles and all the world to pray for the return of Israel. As well, God showed me that the story 
uh, or the law of Moses, the 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 the, uh, the netzit that, that we wear as Jews that has the fringes on the four corners of the garment. Again, showing that we'd be scattered to the four winds of the earth, and we would be praying for the return of Israel once again. The gleaning, the law of gleaning, when he says to the to the Jews, "Do not glean the four corners of the field; it would be left for the Gentiles and the strangers among you and the poor." Why? Why did he say that? That very law there shows that it would be, look at Ruth, the story of Ruth. I'll do a beautiful video that when God revealed that to me, Ruth is a type of the bride of Christ. And what does she do? She is instrumental in returning the Jews from the four corners of the earth back to the homeland. And if you notice that when, wow, in Revelation, for example, the seventh seal, I'm jumping all around here because I'm trying to give you a little bit of everything that God has dealt with my heart on. The seventh seal speaks of silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour. And it seems like nobody gets what is that. Why did God say there's silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour? I can tell you why. It's written in the Torah. Does not the scripture say, let all the earth keep silent for he has risen up out of his holy habitation? And then what about the story of Boaz and Ruth? When Ruth comes back and she tells Naomi, who is a type of Israel that comes back, says, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter, because God has dealt bitterly all the death that happened in her family was a type of Israel and the Holocaust and all the Jews that were lost. And when she comes back, Ruth is a type of the bride of Christ. And when she comes and, and she's sitting at the feet of Naomi, she, first she's at the feet of Boaz, and she says, hold still my daughter, for he will not be able to rest until he has redeemed you this day. And he, he has to redeem Naomi in order to get Ruth. Showing that Israel will be redeemed at the same time that the bride has taken her flight. My gosh, it's just one revelation after another, after another, after another that God deals with me on. And I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to deal with all of it. My wife says when I open up the Bible and begin to read, just something happens. And, and I, I can't really say it's always like that. But it's so much happens like this on a regular basis. And I don't know how to deal with it other than just tell the people about it. You know, another beautiful story, and I, and I really want to get to the rock, because that's, that's, that is probably the, the premise in the book of Yom Suf is the rock, because it's the identity of the Messiah, and I want to tell you that before I get too far into this here. Um, the, the, recently, I did, a, uh, I did a video on the story of Esther, because Esther was another beautiful revelation that God showed me. I never thought of Esther like this before at all. Vashti represented Israel when the king is actually a representation of God in this case. When he calls out uh, Vashti to come be seen with him, and she refuses. Israel, when, when Christ came, she refused to be seen with her Messiah. So he doesn't divorce her, but he takes her crown and gives it to another. Doesn't the scriptures say that he, they give it to a more worthy one and it ends up being to the Gentiles, becomes the queen, becomes the bride of Christ? And we find that that's what Esther does. But the thing is, as many times Christians are looking at this as like they're going to a great big party when the rapture takes place. I know there's some that believe in the rapture, some that don't. I'm not here to debate that issue. The, the thing I'm trying to show you, though, is Esther is a type of the bride of Christ. And we find that when the Jews are about to be annihilated, Mordecai says to her, perhaps for such a time as this, you were brought to this position. And when she goes to go before the king, he sticks out the golden scepter and allows her to come. And she cries out for the life of the Jews. The bride doesn't just go up into, up into heaven for some great big party. Yes, it is a marriage supper. We know that. But it's also at the same time to cry out for the life of the Jews when she's at the brink of destruction again. So many beautiful revelations. Now, let's hit the main one that's in the book of Yom Suf, the last chapter. I go into this in very much detail in the book. And I, I chose this because the children of Israel needed to see the redemption story. They need to know the plan of salvation that God had. And God dealt with this for me in a way that they could understand, in a way that makes sense to them. If the Jewish people will take the time not look at the Talmud as our plumb line. And yet the Talmud does tell us that the Messiah was supposed to come before the destruction of the second temple. They're just looking at Daniel's writings. They see that from Daniel's writings. So what happened? 
okay? One of the greatest mysteries for the Jews is when Moses, not the fact that he strikes the rock, but that the rock is called Hatsua. In Hebrew, we call it Hatsua. Puts a definite article in front of the word Sua, which the word Sua is rock, the He, the letter He, which means the rock. So we recognize that the same rock is moving about from place to place. We know that God is upon this rock. God is, the rock basically represents God. Now, the Christian Bible speaks about Christ being the rock. Now, we find that when Moses smites the rock, the water comes forth, the waters of life. It represents eternal life. So what I do in, this, in the book of Yom Suf, when God revealed this to me, and this is a very deep revelation, and, and, and um, the video, I believe, let me see, I actually was writing down. I think the mystery hidden behind the veil is going to be one of the best videos you could watch on that there where I really break that down. So I'm just going to try to do a quick version for you here. You have to go back to the Garden of Eden in the story. That's what I do in the book. I take them back to the Garden of Eden. And I use the rock in the story here because why? Ron Wyatt discovers a lot of archaeological evidence to suggest that Mount Sinai is actually in Saudi Arabia, not in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, the Caldwells, Jim and Penny Caldwell, find that uh, find the, the, the split rock that is there and they photograph this momentous 60-foot rock here and this is where it is believed that Moses smote the rock and the water did gush forth out of it. There's water erosion on the rock, etc. You may know the story already about the Caldwells. Um, but when I saw that, I knew that that was a trouble, troubled spot for the Jews is why does Moses call this Hatsua? Why is it the rock? Because the rock is in different locations, but they know that it's the same rock all the time. And when God began to deal with me on this, he took me to Genesis and then all the way forward into the time of Jesus. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and the Samaritan woman, and he said, bring me a drink. If you knew it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And we know that he's speaking about the spirit of God. He said, I would give you water that you don't have to come here to drink. He's actually giving her a sign. Because she knew that when Moses smote the rock, water came forth. And it does represent life. And Jesus gives her a sign to look for. And that's going to be the water. When his side will be smitten and the water will come forth from his side. Now, I take in the book, I go back to Genesis first to establish the fact that God indeed had given Adam and Eve the Holy Ghost. Which it brings out another tremendous revelation as well, and that is something that my wife had been doing a lot of research on, and that is equality. Did God create men to rule over women, or is there just some misinterpretations in Scripture of Paul's writings? And we find out that it's just misinterpret, not misinterpreted, mistranslations of it. And so when God was dealing with me, because I do understand the Hebrew language, he began to reveal to me not only the process of redemption for Israel, but I also find out that God never intended for man to rule women in the first place. So there's just all kinds of revelations that go along with this. Now, let's real quick look at that. What happens in the Garden of Eden? When God is creating man from the dust of the ground, he creates him, we find out in Genesis chapter of 2, and when he, when he brings him, makes that, that body, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Now in Hebrew it says nishmat chayim. Nishmat is to breathe, but the chayim is what's the interesting part here. Chayim or, comes, is a plural form for the word life. Literally, it's broken down from the Hebrew word uh, from the word God, it's God's own life, y Yahweh's life, in a plural form. And he breathed a plural form of life into Adam. Why? Because Eve was actually inside of that body right there. She had not been taken out from, uh, from the man, so she was actually inside of him. They were one unit. Now, here's what really gets beautiful about this right here. When God first creates Adam, we... The rabbis have never fully understand why does he call him Ish. We translate that, man, that as man, but literally in Hebrew it comes from the compound words of fire and Yahweh, God's name, his self, 
is where we get the name Ish from. And also when he takes Eve out, he makes her Isha, which again is from fire. And the second letter in the divine name of God, the He. So you have yod He, which is Yah or God. And you have the word fire with their two names there, showing that it was the fire of God or the Shekinah glory that was dwelling inside of them. Now, Backing up real quick, let me just kind of make this, try to make this as simple as I can. I know it may be hard because we're doing so much in, in such a small space here. When God is making Adam, he makes him ish. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, the chayim. In the midst of the garden is the tree of life, which is eitz chayim. See the two same words there? So it shows us that what was breathed into Adam's body was the fruit from the tree of life. The Chaim, the life of Yahweh, was breathed into his nostrils there. But then ironically in the next verse, it says that man became a living soul, is how you translate that in English. It actually says, Lenefesh, uh, Lenefesh, uh, for the soul uh, of Adam, of, of man, was Chaya. Now he makes the life of God singular, because why? He's implying it to Adam as a singular, not as a plural. But when he breathes it in there, he breathes it in the plural. So anyway, what happens later? We find out that God opens up his flesh. A lot of people say he took a rib. Doesn't say that in the Hebrew language. We don't have any word where it says he took, takes a rib from Adam's side. But it says he opens up, he opens up the flesh and he takes from, and it literally says, min ish, from that fire of Yahweh, he takes Isha and makes her. Then no doubt from the DNA of the flesh and everything, he makes a body that's for him. Now one thing that it doesn't show in the story here that I really believe is that Adam was longing for this wife. He was at a point to me that he was just in such a travail wanting his helpmate. But notice, though, God puts Adam into a deep sleep in order to bring forth his bride. Now, a lot of the rabbinical scholars say that when Adam was, when God took, he, they believe that he actually split Adam and took that whole side off of Adam in order to make his wife Eve. Now, she wasn't called Eve at that time either. That's another interesting fact that we have to look at. She was actually just called, uh, she was called uh, uh, Isha. Uh, Eve comes later, which means mother of living, Chava in Hebrew. But anyway, he takes when he makes when he takes and splits that body. That's where I believe that it shows why Moses smote the rock. God was showing the children of Israel how he brought forth life when he took Adam and split Adam. He brought that life out of Adam in order to make his his mother or his bride uh, uh, Eve. And that life came forth and, and made her. So it was imparted, which also is a type of John. Why John? Because you'll never find, let me just say this guy, I'm saying John is going to throw you off here. When God took Eve and he creates her body and he brings her to the man, he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Never do we find a place where God had to breathe into her nostrils the breath of life. Why? She already had it. She represents the bride of Christ. The same thing that we have with um, when we're looking at John the Baptist, John the Baptist comes forth as the beginning of the church or the beginning of the bride of Christ, and he receives the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Why? Just like Eve. Eve did not have to have the breath of life breathed in her because she already had it when she came out. And so that's why John, has a, that's, some, that's not in the book, by the way. That, that's just something God revealed to me recently. Just beautiful, beautiful revelation there. But anyway... So they both come out with the Holy Spirit. They have the life of Yahweh in them, the fire of God, the Shekinah. And then sin comes in. And when sin comes in, God removes that spirit. And sadly enough, then he puts the cherubims and he, to guard the way, le shemoah, le shemel. He, he puts them there to guard the way of the tree of life. The Dedek means way in Hebrew. Of, uh, and what's funny is he says, Eitz Chachayim. The, again, the definite article, hey, in front of Chaim, showing it was someone. That tree, like the rock, was a specific tree. It was a specific rock. And of course, Christ was that rock. Now, 
when he came, when, when it shows that he had to guard the way of the tree of life, then Jesus comes. And we, we fail to recognize the fact that Jesus was speaking to Jewish people things that they should have gotten. When he said that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, Jesus was trying to show the people he was that Eitz Chaim in the garden. He, he says right there, I am the, the life which is the Chaim. That's why he breathed on his apostles and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why did he do that? He was showing them that he was the tree of life in the garden of Eden that breathed in the nostrils of Adam, that breathed Adam and Eve's life, their soul, their very life of God inside of them. He was that one that did that. Now, let me just show you the part though that shows the equality that God never intended for man to rule over his wife. The fall itself showed me that. When God created them and then the fall comes and God says to, to his wife, he says, you will turn to your husband. It's actually, I think it's tashuv in Hebrew, uh, tashuv, which means you will turn to him. And then God says to her, and he shall rule over you. God is only prophesying what's going to happen as a result of sin, as a result of losing the Holy Ghost. Adam no longer has the Holy Ghost. It also tells us that Eve had her own personal relationship with God. It wasn't that she had, to, had a channel, I got to go through my husband in order to be able to talk to God. She said she talked to God. She got these things from God. Okay, so she is now turning to her husband because she lose that, loses that relationship with God, so she turns to the strongest thing there is, and that's her husband. Remember how David, when, when God, uh, excuse me, not David, but when, when Israel rejected Samuel being the prophet over Israel, and they wanted a king, and God says to Samuel, he said, they didn't reject you, they rejected me. He said, but go tell them what's going to happen as a result. They're going to want your sons, they're going to want your daughters, and they're going to become the, 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 the they're going to be his soldiers, and they're going to be uh, the maidservants and everything. God shows the result of what's going to happen for rejecting God's provided way. Same thing happened with Adam and Eve. Not only that, God also says to Eve, you shall bring forth children of sorrow and pain. That sorrow and pain happens to be of the heart. And he doesn't say you bring forth children. Literally in Hebrew, it actually says, Teladim Banim, you shall birth sons. God was prophesying that it would cause her sorrow and pain. Why? Because one's going to kill the other, but he doesn't just come out and say that. So we find out that Adam and Eve were equal. There was not one over the other. And then when Jesus comes on the earth, we never see Jesus belittling women. In fact, he does everything totally the opposite. He's hanging out with women when he's not supposed to according to the way the law is written. Paul, if you really read, read the Clementine writings, we find out that Paul actually, that his women were the most liberated of that day. We find out that uh, Junius was a female apostle that the Vatican changed in the 1400s and made it a male apostle. So, so many beautiful things about this. Now, let me get back to the story of redemption. Why this is the story of redemption though. We find out they lose the Holy Spirit. I remember how we say that God put Adam into a deep sleep in order to bring forth his bride? Well, when they lost that way for the tree of life, God had to take, in order to bring redemption, he had to recreate another body, another Adam, the second Adam as we call Christ. And inside of that second Adam, he put the Chaim, the fullness of God. In other words, all of the Holy Ghost that was ever going to be imparted out on the children of Israel and as well as the Gentiles as well, he put in Christ. So when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, he said, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink that you wouldn't come here no more. And when they hung him on Calvary and he was dying, God put him into a deep sleep as well called death. And we know it's a deep sleep because what did he say about Lazarus? He sleepeth. But when they didn't get it, he said more plainly, he's dead. Adam, no doubt, was to the point of death in order to bring forth his bride. And when Jesus was in that deep sleep called death, the Roman soldier took and he ripped his side open. And when he did, the blood and the water came out. So many things could be said right there. But that water was the sign that he told her to look for the Samaritan woman, which represented the rock that was back there. There was smoke by Moses. Moses showing that when Christ would be smitten, the water of life would be released and the spirit of almighty God could come back upon the children of Israel.
The Holy Ghost that they were looking for. The Holy Ghost that they had need of. That life that we had need of was imparted finally. These are the things that are written in this book. Some things God has been revealing since then, like the story of, of Esther and things. But there's so much. I talk about James Dobson, Dr. Dobson, when Dr. Dobson, in, in the beginning of that chapter, he does the book, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And he gives the story, the different things that the, that the Christians go through that seems like, why would God do the things that he does? And I cite some of those events. And I remember when Dr. Dobson came out with that book. I remember when he first came out, I listened to it on the radio. But I thought to myself when I was writing Yom Suf, if there was ever a people that could relate to what he's saying, and that's the Jewish people. Because there's so many things that have happened to our people that doesn't seem to make sense. My mother's side of family that, is, that was Jewish that came to the United States illegally, the Heinrich family and the Coleman's, she's from Heinrich's, Coleman's, Bolton's, there's 1,500 records on the Yad Vashem records with her family. There's so many more things that I could tell you, but I don't want to waste your time. I know it's very valuable, and I thank you. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to be able to share this with you. And I really believe that, I don't know if Sid Roth will even see this particular video here for being for the research department, but I, I, wanted, I do want to tell you one thing. I have heard that Sid Roth's passion for the Jewish people and for them to recognize Messiah is tremendously great. These insights, these revelations that God deals with my heart on, and so many more that I just, I can't remember to tell them all. It's just an anointing that comes upon me. These are things that the Jewish mind can receive. I believe before God sends the two witnesses that there's going to be a revival amongst the Jews, secular, religious, whatever, the Jews that have not returned to Israel, because that bride, when John sees that number, peep, that group of people that no man could number, it also mentions there's tribes in there. Part of the tribes of Israel make up that bride of Christ as well. Although there is that remnant of the 144,000 that will be the Jewish remnant that is in Israel today looking for Mashiach. And I believe we have a message to get, that we're duty bound to get to the people. And unfortunately, the Jewish people have been blinded by all the different doctrines that are in Christianity. Not that there's not good people. There's great people, wonderful Christians in all these different walks of life. But when they look at all these, no wonder, I say in many of the videos, no wonder why he sends two witnesses to Israel. Because what do, what do we have as Jews? What can we look at? Do we say the Baptists are right, but the Pentecostals are wrong, the Pentecostals are right? You know, it's really a confusion. We need one thing. We need the Messiah. We need Mashiach. We need Jesus. We need Yeshua. And I stand in the middle and the gap between the different groups and the different denominations in order for my people to benefit from it. There's many Jews that, that watch these videos that I do on YouTube. They write me. And I think that's why if Sid takes this to a national level, we'll see a movement amongst the Jewish people. Even uh, Nehemiah Gordon, he's been talking to me quite a bit on Facebook. He's reading the book, Yom Suf. Perhaps maybe he will believe. God bless you. Thank you for your time.